I'm going to mute everyone and like I said you have the chat option so I will uh, go ahead and uh, start now okay uh, so uh, let's see I should go to the first slide here that's two so this is the title uh, of our project uh, that uh, we submitted the proposal to uh, the Wood Education Resource Center, which is part of the uh, forest, uh, forest, Pro forest Service, U.S. Forest Service. And that's us on the left, the Appalachian Hardwood Center. Our mission is to assist the wood products industry in West Virginia and the region and that pretty much means hardwoods. So it was a good fit. Uh, green hardwood pallets um, would be affected, especially by uh, phytosanitation requirements. Uh, so the the origin, 2009, APHIS uh, had the advanced notice of proposed rulemaking. There's the link uh, to it, and then a two-month comment period followed. And during that comment period, a uh, vast majority uh, from the wood products, uh, wood pallet uh, materials industry and uh, the stakeholders of such uh, argued uh, that there was no need for regulations on WPM. So following the close of the comment period, uh, APHIS carried out a risk assessment and in a nutshell, um, it said that unregulated movement of domestic wood packaging material uh, is not without risk to the timber resource, but the risk is not high enough to justify implementation uh, of an ISPM 15 type treatment requirement. And there's the link to, to that. And this will all be posted to our website, so in case you missed something. And that risk assessment published in 2011, May 2011, so without regulations uh, to drive our project, we kind of substituted, did a change of scope with Wood Education Resource Center, uh, changed regulations to best management practices. Um, and that's basically where we stand now in this, in this, this uh, presentation is part of where we're taking it. And I'll close with uh, where we're taking it. Um, so uh, for, for now, I'm going to pass it over to Paul uh, Shalou uh, of APHIS. He is a policy manager of the uh, APHIS EAD program, and um, I'll uh, let him take it from there. He is not going to use slides, so what I will do is just let you enjoy my, um, my uh, little... Uh, Slot, uh, uh, palette there. So, Paul, uh, if you want to take it over. Hi, uh, very good. I appreciate it. Uh, I appreciate being invited to be part of the webinar today as well. It is uh, definitely chilly here in the Washington, D.C. area. As Jeff mentioned, I, am, uh, I work for USDA APHIS, and um, for about six years now I've been the National Policy Manager for the Emerald Ash Borer Program. Uh, about a month ago, a day after my birthday on January 6th, it became official that in addition to those duties, I have the same duties now for the Gypsy Moth program as well. I have two very large, sprawling programs, but uh, going back in history, it took us, uh, you know, 2008, 2009 time period. Uh, the National Wooden Pallet and Container Association approached uh, our agency and, and, and asked if we could look at whether it made sense to promulgate regulations governing the interstate movement of wood packaging materials. Uh, what NWPCA told us at the time, and, and, uh, and I believe it remains true today, is that they certainly don't want to be uh, part of the problem in terms of, of moving uh, pass on wood packaging materials interstate as opposed to internationally. And so that began the process that Jeff outlined very briefly. Uh, we did a kind of a cursory look at it and, and in a sense on the surface of it it made sense that if we're seeing uh, various invasive forest pests move internationally on wood packaging material, 
Uh, perhaps the same thing could be true uh, domestically. And, uh, and so we decided, well, you know, based on, um, on just kind of that, that quick and dirty look at the situation, let's, you know, um, kind of fire up the, the formal mechanisms we have to pursue rulemaking, uh, including the publication of the advance notice of proposed rulemaking, which is exactly uh, what the title describes. It, it, it is an instrument that we publish in the Federal Register that, uh, that basically says we're, we're thinking about rules around this issue, this topic, and we'd like to gather feedback. It is certainly not a notice of a proposed rule. It, it just is an information gathering mechanism that's available uh, to us. And so we published the ANPR, and as Jeff mentioned, we also uh, held a series of four public meetings at various locations around the country, uh, Portland, Oregon, down in Texas, up in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And of course, the first of those four meetings was uh, at, at our department headquarters building on the mall in Washington, D.C., in the Jefferson Auditorium. Um, the feedback that we got through that process was, uh, as Jeff said, uh, we had a great turnout from the industry. We chose the locations that we did uh, to try and, and gather a wide variety of input uh, from the industry. We know that the, the WPM industry in the Northwest, for instance, is, is not exactly the same as it is uh, east of the Mississippi River and certainly not the same as it is uh, down south. Different types of materials are used, uh, different uh, materials, hardwood versus softwood and so on. Uh, slightly different um, manufacturing methodologies are used, and, and we wanted to hear from all of those uh, different voices about whether what we were thinking about uh, made sense or not. The, the industry, as Jeff uh, outlined, was was largely uh, saw no no value in it. Uh, certainly, uh, environmental groups that attended the meetings uh, and, and some private citizens thought that anything we can do to protect the forest might make sense to do. Um, so <clears throat> with that information in hand and, and with the information contained in the pest risk analysis that we published in 2011, as, as Jeff mentioned, uh, all of which is available on our website, um, what we realized when it was all said and done was uh, we couldn't say whether pests were moving on pallets or not, uh, and, and other wood packaging materials moving domestically, uh, simply because the mechanisms aren't in place to collect that data. Uh, when goods are moving internationally, they have to enter through a port of entry, they have to go through customs, uh, there are inspection protocols, there are data capture. Uh, systems in place to capture the outcomes of those inspections uh, and so forth. But uh, by and large, uh, those kinds of, of um, uh, capacities don't exist uh, when goods are moving interstate, and, and arguably perhaps that's a good thing. Uh, and, and so when it was all said and done, what we could say is that certainly if we were to require treatment of pallets moving uh, between states, uh, there would be a significant cost at a, a conservative estimate of about a 50 cent per pallet treatment cost, with roughly a half a billion pallets being uh, constructed each year. Uh, you're talking about $250 million of very direct cost, which automatically would make it uh, significantly uh, uh, a significant rule on the economic front, um, and, and because we couldn't quantify at all whether, whether or not there was the pest risk uh, because of the lack of systems to capture that kind of information, but we knew that it would be uh, propose significant economic burdens uh, on, on, on a very core part of, of our economy here, almost everything that anybody gets, as everybody on this webinar I'm sure knows, uh, you go to the, the store and you pick something off the shelves, it almost certainly arrived at that store uh, on a pallet or otherwise associated with WPM. So, so WPM sits right at the core of our economy. And we would be touching virtually the entire goods transport system uh, with the regulation, having a very significant impact on it but couldn't say what we would actually 
uh, be providing by doing so in the way of a benefit. So with that inability to uh, complete the cost-benefit equation, uh, we were unable to, to continue pursuing the regs uh, that, uh, that we had been thinking about. And so uh, that kind of brings us to where we're at now. Um, I, I personally, I work uh, with our domestic programs, as I've outlined, our, uh, within APHIS. We have a, a, a staff that works on, on international trade issues, import and export issues. Um, and, and then there's a, another staff that if something slips through the cracks and actually lands stateside like EAB did uh, roughly 20 years ago, uh, like Gypsy Moth did 150 or so years ago, uh, and the list goes on and on, uh, we have to do something about them once they're here. And, and so I work on, on the domestic program side of things. Um, we are looking at, at this point in time, we're working closely with Canada on a pilot project called Beyond the Borders uh, to really kind of take what's uh, sometimes referred to as a perimeter approach to protecting not just our country, uh, but the continent um, from invasive forest uh, insects and, and other pests uh, entering the country through WPM. Um, after all, we do share an extensive land border with Canada, uh, to say the least. And uh, the forests and the pests that affect the forests are, are certainly not aware of lines that we as humans draw on maps. And, uh, and so it may make more sense to, to kind of think of North America as a whole and, and try and protect it and harmonize everything that we're doing with Canada um, uh, cohesively so that all of North America is, is being protected uh, simultaneously and, and in the same fashion. So. Uh, that project is ongoing. Um, I'm not directly involved with it. I follow it just a little bit. I believe that they're going to be starting up a pilot project at a single port to kind of see um, exactly how that uh, that would work out. Uh, that would be at International Falls, the, the pilot project. Um, the other thing that I, I can tell you in terms of, of kind of where we're going with things is um, uh, of course, uh, when we implemented ISPM 15 here in the United States uh, back in 2005, depending on how you want to, uh, we exempted Canada uh, and Mexico, but particularly Canada, uh, from uh, from needing to meet ISPM 15 requirements for wood packaging materials entering our country from there and, and vice versa. Um, in harmony with Canada, uh, because we do actually have a, a slightly different exotic forest pest mix uh, in our two countries, and we certainly don't want uh, uh, a brown spruce longhorn beetle here in the United States, for instance, um, and, and it certainly is present in Canada. Uh, we've been working forward on, on removing that exemption for WPM moving across the border. Uh, that's in departmental review at this point in time. Um, uh, when rules like that go into review, uh, time frames become very uncertain. Uh, each reviewer that touches it as it goes through the review process uh, has their own time frames and, and their own issues that they're asked to consider. And so uh, it would be inappropriate to give you an idea, try and comment on when we might publish that as a proposed rule. But that is then drafted and is, as I say, in departmental review. The other thing that I can tell you is we remain, we remain very closely involved with the international community on, uh, on ISPM 15 issues in general. Uh, there's obviously been some talk over the last uh, five or 10 years about you know, is the 56 for 30 heat treatment standard adequate? Uh, it is, after all, a consensus treatment. Um, and, and so uh, the other issue is, are there other treatments that uh, perhaps might be uh, more efficient, more effective in certain circumstances? And, uh, and one of the things that uh, has happened fairly recently is we've been uh, with our international partners um, in the IPPC looking at uh, radio frequency as a means of delivering heat, a heat treatment to wood packaging materials that uh, I'm given to understand from uh, from our research staff that's, that's been working on that. 
uh, that the RF treatment has been accepted by IPPC, um, and it's now a matter of, you know, uh, again, kind of going through that internationally rulemaking process to get it on the book. Um, the RF treatment standard would be heating the wood to um, 60 degrees Celsius for one minute. Uh, and, and of course, you know, meeting a, a whole battery of technical requirements about how the equipment, so on. But one of the issues with RF treatment is um, delivering heat evenly throughout the profile of the wood being treated, and that's where those technical standards come in. So that's kind of where our agency is at on wood packaging materials at the moment, and I hope that helps everybody just a little bit with a, a bit of information they didn't have. So back to you, John. All right, Paul, thank you very much. And uh, just uh, to say that Paul has been a great assistance to me in, in helping me uh, understand the, the, what, what goes on uh, at APHIS relative to the uh, wood products uh, uh, area and specifically wood packaging, but also firewood as well. Um, very kind, John. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So our next our next presenter uh, will be Brad Gething. Uh, he is technical manager of uh, NWPCA, and uh, I'm going to mute Paul and uh, unmute Brad. So Brad, you are good to go. Are you there? Uh, hello. Can can everyone hear? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Great. Okay. So um, yeah. Well. First, uh, uh, I'd like to say thanks. You are kind of going in and out. I don't know if it's a microphone placement. Can, is that better? Uh, keep going. No, it's still, still very fuzzy. Technology. Um, are you still? Uh, you're still on the screen. You there? Is that you, Brad? Are you there, Brad? Okay, he's here. He just texted me. I've got you on uh, muted. Um, uh, I, were you on uh, mic and speakers, perhaps vo uh, voice over internet? Maybe you could call in. Or actually, here's uh, what we could do. Hopefully, uh, text me. If you think this is a good idea, we can we can switch it to Larry and let Larry give his presentation, and then hopefully you can straighten out the uh, audio. Okay, uh, he's going to call in, so apologies for the delay. We'll just hold on here a second, and just a reminder: I think uh, John came on late. This this is being recorded. If you if you miss something at the beginning uh, of Paul's uh, talk, uh, that it will be posted to our website. It's a good thing it's not a radio broadcast. Dead air time is uh, absolutely a no-no for radio broadcasts, right? So, 
You there, Brad? Yeah, I'm still not hearing anything, uh, Brad. If anybody else is hearing them, send me a message. Uh, it might be my end. Uh, okay, there, there. Is that you? Yes, it's me. Okay, yeah, because it changed from microphone to a little yeah. phone uh, emblem. So, okay, we're all set there. And so here is Brad Gething. Oh, I'm sorry about that, everyone. I, ch I called in early to make sure that wouldn't happen, and it happened anyway. <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, as I was saying, um, I, I'd like to thank Jeff and the Appalachian Hardwood Center for, for putting the event together. Um, you know, the issue of protecting our forests is, is – of a really high uh, priority to to NWPCA and the industry, and um, we believe that uh, information sessions like this uh, play a big role in in helping to uh, you know move things forward. Uh, I think uh, I think Paul outlined uh, the complications of the of the issue well, and um, you know where uh, trying to you know I think a lot of everyone in the industry has a, has a desire to um, come to some kind of solution but without um, some hardcore evidence to say uh, you know that uh, wood packaging plays a role in uh, in spreading um, uh, invasive species domestically um, it's going to be hard to uh, you know make uh, some strong decisions to to regulate uh, things so um, but we uh, like as Paul said also that uh, you know, we have a relationship with APHIS, you know, going back on this issue that we're trying to, you know, do everything we can to to uh, make a get a decision that's that's going to make sense. Um, and that's another reason why we're based here in D.C. We're close to regulatory issues, and and that's why we're continuing to uh, to participate in events like this. Um, so, and also um, just uh, from from a global perspective is. Uh, we're 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 participating in things like the the World Palette Congress, where we're looking at. Uh, I'm a participant in um, IFQUARC, the International Forest Research uh, Quarantine Group, um, and and other things like uh, NAPO and the Continental Dialogue. So we're out there. We're trying to collaborate with whomever and whoever uh, we can to uh, continue to. You know, promote uh, best practices and um, you know get get the word out that um, we're we're a willing partner um, in in this issue of uh, invasive insects. Um, I think it's a the one thing that I, I think is important was is also to recognize some um, you know world perspective and um, just that ISPM 15 started with 78 countries when it was first instituted, and now it's up to 180. So I, I think the popularity of, of the program um, you know, and how it increased is encouraging um, the, to, the, to the point of, you know, it's, you know, the, the international issue of things coming to the United States and then how we handle that domestically um, is another issue. So. Um, if you look at, you know, if we can stop, you know, uh, international um, incursions coming to our borders, uh, we we can make a, a strong case, you know, toward, um, you know, preventing uh, further incursions, you know, domestically. Um, another thing with, that I think um, is important is uh, the these benchmarks of trying to determine if. Uh, or how these programs, how effective the programs are, and it turns out that there's um, there's some difficulty, uh, and, and Paul outlined, you know, how difficult it would be uh, for domestic 
uh, to to understand um, how we can measure uh, you know movement and incursions and uh, finding what's infested and what's not. Um, and uh, the the difficulty has been in trying to understand if if these types of programs are effective is that pre ISPN 15 there's really not that much data out there in terms of you know what uh, what things were found and and how they were and how they were transported and where hitchhikers were so um, but there is a, a limited amount of, of data out there and um, there's been some some really uh, you know groundbreaking work I think um, out of Michigan State with uh, with with uh, Robert Hack and the uh, Forest Service, and uh, yeah, there there is some some limiting data out there that shows that um, ISPM 15 you know has improved um, you know, the the incursion rate. Um, it, uh, showed that uh, interception uh, interception rates have have increased you know between 36 and 52 percent depending on what the data that you look at. Um, between uh, 2003 and 2009, so um, I think that's an indication that the program you know, is working. And um, but with the number of international shipments increasing, um, you know, we're still everyone is still tr you know, striving for for some improvement. Um, so overall, uh, I think um, looking forward, uh, we're we're hoping to see more opportunities um, develop. And I, I think uh, what what Paul had outlined, um, you know, the, the the pilot program with Canada could be a great example uh, of what um, what can be achieved. You know, uh, looking at small programs and then potentially growing them. And um, you know, we at NWPCA are are, are looking to um, see how we can be a part of that and um, help promote these programs uh, whenever they whenever they uh, become available. So, uh, so again, I just want to reiterate that uh, you know we're here to to uh, do what we can to uh, protect the forests, and and we know that uh, you know, the forests are the lifeblood of the of the industry. So, uh, the healthier they are, the healthier the industry will be. So, uh, with that, um, I'll turn it over to everybody else. I, I'm I'm here as a participant, you know, as a speaker, but I'm here also as a participant. Um, to, to learn about you know what else is going on as much as anybody else here. Great, thanks, Brad. So if you have questions for uh, Brad between now and uh, the end of the con you can always you can send him a message uh, via the chat box. Uh, again, Brad, thank you very much for uh, being here and and uh, helping educate uh, the group. And uh, now. Uh, I'll pass it over to my colleague and friend Larry, uh, who uh, will cover a bit more of an academic uh, end of things, um, if you will, uh, practical. I'll let him uh, explain. So I change presenter to Larry Osborne. And Larry, you should have the screen now. We'll find out in a moment. I'm about to hit the button. So, so you, yeah, I, I'm in the middle of this uh, thing. Uh, unfortunately, I, I learned a while ago yeah. that I can't really think without a PowerPoint presentation in front of me anymore. So hopefully, that has appeared on your screen. And and text in if it if it's not, and we'll figure it out. If you're seeing it, Jeff, and hope yeah, drying it hardwood is. pallets. Okay. Um, I hate to admit how long I've been wrapped up in the pallet biz, on and off. It, it, I try to get away from it, and I keep getting sucked back in. Um, I go back to the days of Walt Walleen and George Stern when they were working on pallet durability stuff. And so that has kind of been burned into my brain. And I still come at pallets that way, even though you know, I'm, I have to rethink what I'm doing when we start thinking about uh, one-way pallets and, and that sort of thing. So uh, there, you know, there is that obvious slant to the, to the way my brain works. And I'll, I'll just try to take that into account as I, as I wander along here. 
one of the first things I ran into, uh, even as a grad student, uh, was looking through the old pallet durability data. Um, Wallene and Stern and others followed a bunch of warehouse pallets around the country, literally, and checking for damage, counting number of handlings, number of trips, and that's the information that has gone into the pallet design system for predicting pallet life and durability. Um, one thing that just stood out as I was looking over that data again was that there was a group of medium density hardwood pallets dried that just seemed to outperform things that they shouldn't have, according to what I had been led to believe. And so I've also always kind of fixated on drying pallets as, as a way of extending pallet life. And first thing I did then was ask Wallene, well, you know, I'm not seeing any dry pallets. And, and he says, well, the world changed. You know, the specifications changed that people had to build to, and of course the, the, the price pressures um, were a little milder than they are at the moment, but that, you know, that too has continued to escalate. And, and so the, you know, as much as I would like to see dry pallets, I, I understand that there's a battle going on all the time. Um, which is why I put a question mark after after my title. Um, you know, there are good things about it, bad things about it. And one of the issues currently is this pallet mold thing. And again, it's these changing pressures on the product and elsewhere down the supply chain to cut cost, cut cost, cut cost, do it faster, do it cheaper. And there's just no time for pallets to dry. In, in many cases, you get thrown into a truck trailer or into a shipping container, and that's where the fun begins. Um, just for reference, um, get a sense of how, how much water is coming out of these things. Just a standard 4840 pallet going from green to about 25% or less, it's going to dump about one and a half gallons of water. And if you go down to closer to 12%, um, then you're looking at close to two gallons of water. Multiply that by how many pallets are in the trailer or in the uh, container or sitting in a warehouse. Um, that's a lot of water. So, and nothing new here. Uh, the, the battle of you know the advantages and disadvantages of dry pallets. You know, the usual shipping weight and costs, um, reduced risk of moisture damage to the product, increased wood strength. Uh, we also did a study way back when on pallet racking systems. And if you put a green pallet into a rack with a load on it, you will build in some permanent distortion in that pallet for the rest of its life. Uh, so it's all these kinds of things. Uh, the cons, of course, the extra costs. I, I should have highlighted that in bigger letters. But uh, sometimes may have to pre-drill the deck boards. But um, I'm finding less and less evidence that that's going to be critical in terms of uh, the integrity of the pallet structure. Uh, but it does then, in some cases, become a ca uh, situation where there's increased wear on the nailing machines at the, at the time of manufacture. So you know, the issue doesn't really go away. It just shows up in a different form. My little note here to myself and everybody else, you know, this, this whole battle be becomes an opportunity for pallet and packaging design with your customers and you know, looking at the whole process you know, farther down the line, which nobody really takes time to get to do. Uh, but that's kind of a crisis. Um, the other thing, well, we'll get to it. Um, again, dried pallets, if, if somebody specifies a dried pallet, you know, we're all hoping that there, there's a 
hardwood pallet option there, um, but uh, the costs are, are an issue. A lot of people go to softwoods because the softwood lumber industry is geared up for drying uh, softwood lumber to a, a reasonable moisture content um, for, for pallet use. There's these other products out there that we try not to talk about, but they're actually there. And then these other options for dealing with the moisture in enclosed spaces. Um, again, nothing new or exciting there at this point. But the point I try to make for people is, you know, each of those protective methods has a cost. You know, okay, you, you've deferred maybe the cost of drying the pallet at the time of manufacture, but you then along the way incur these other costs trying to protect your product and uh, everything else downstream. My, I, I did, you know, somewhere next, I did encounter, ah, a couple slides away, we'll get there, okay. Um, as I said, going way back, you know, the need for dry pallets has always been there. Uh, you know, I think the military still has a specification and certainly a need for dry packaging material, putting things into long-term storage. And uh, the option has always been available as long as the customer has been willing to pay the price. And, you know, the military is one of those customers that, you know, they, apparently they, they can pay the price for, for dried pallets. Uh, it's not their money, so it seems to work. Not picking on the military in particular, it's just a, a situation that I was familiar with. But again, the battle comes down to the pallet buyer has little or no incentive to purchase higher priced dried pallets unless that's required in their own pallet specification. And what kind of happens going back to the dry pallets versus the other options, you can't see a dry pallet. You can't see the difference between a dry pallet and a green pallet. You, know, you, you just can't. There's not that big a difference. All those other protective additions, the pallet pads, the vapor barriers, those are visual. They're easy to see. You know, they show up in a specification every, all the way down the line. Everybody says, oh, what a great job these guys have done about protecting the load. So there, there's that visual battle that we're also fighting with, with pallets. Um, one of the main factors that limits, you know, as pallet manufacturers are under increasing pressure to reduce costs and everyone else in the supply stream is under the same pressure to reduce costs. Um, it's there's just not that much more you can do to reduce the price of a pallet. I mean, if you start going to much thinner deck boards and thing bad things start to happen, you know, there there are you do reach a tipping point here where you just cannot do much. To more to, to reduce the cost of the pallets. Um, that if, if you go past that tipping point, you know, you're just increasing the, the potential for product damage downstream, and you know people start to scream, and those costs just get transferred downstream, um, e either in terms of product damage or product returns or increased protective packaging. So, you know, yeah, the pallet price was cheap, but things start to show up downstream. Um, this was the, the note I was trying to get to. Moisture protection materials and product damage costs are usually more expensive than the cost to dry the pallet, which intuitively I, I always knew, but it was nice to finally some, find somebody else who was looking at that and made the point. Um, it, was, it was easier, um, one of my favorite examples, doing some work with a, a furniture manufacturer and they were having some 
moisture-related defects start to show up in their production line. So we went in, looked at their problems, and made some suggestions, all of which they said, we cannot afford to do. And I said, come with me. I took them to the other side of their manufacturing facility where they were dealing with returns. And you know, this was stuff coming back from their distributors, stuff coming back from the retail customer. Yes, they had this great guarantee, but they were just choking on it. It, it was costing them so much at that end to deal with the rejects that they could have prevented earlier in the process that, you know, it was just great to see the light go on in their heads finally make the connection between their manufacturing process and their their returns. It was easy to deal with them. It was easy for them to see that because they controlled their whole process from start to finish, and they had good contacts with their retailers. Um, it's really not a common situation here in the pallet business. You know, each of these steps seems to be separate, so nobody's connecting the dots, or very few people are connecting the dots. So what are we really trying to achieve in terms of drying pallets um, or trying to avoid this mold and stain issue? Um, from a wood science background, um, you know, if we can keep the board surfaces below 20% moisture content, life gets tough for the, for the fungi. Um, temperatures, you know, they, they're real fungi, uh, the mold and uh, mildew fungi very happy, 65 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, and situations where there's little or no air movement. You know, this is a perfect description of truck trailers, shipping containers, um, warehouses that are very tightly enclosed. Um, all of these factors are coming together and, and just making this mold and mildew problem worse. Um, how dry is dry enough? You know, in the hardwood business, you know, the, the drying industry is set up for the furniture industry, and so they're looking at six to eight percent moisture content as the target. We don't have to go that far with pallets. All we're trying to do is get the board surfaces dry enough to prevent this, this mold and mildew problem. Um, you know, ideally, you know, the, the first step, get it below, get the wood below 30 percent, below fiber saturation point that reduces the risk to the load on the pallet. Um, that's always a good idea. But uh, to prevent this mold and stain, if we can get the average part moisture content to around 25 percent, which is not that much below fiber saturation point, that gives us wood surfaces that are usually below 20 percent and that's enough to inhibit or prevent the, the growth of this mold and mildew. Um, so it's not as horrible a target as we seem to think it is. Um, this, I stumbled across this recent master's thesis by Blount, who uh, it was at Virginia Tech. And it was an excellent study that I will pass on to anybody who's interested in. I, I did get a cop, an electronic copy of his thesis. Um, they were looking at mold and mildew. They were looking at various ways to dry pallets, trying to do cost comparisons, time comparisons. And playing with oak and yellow poplar, which is kind of the both extremes of density. And they found, you know, they kind of backed up this other information, if you can dry pallets to 19 to 25 percent moisture content, that was enough to prevent mold growth on the, on the pallets. They tried really hard to grow mold. I mean, they actually inoculated the pallets with mold spores and gave them nice living conditions. And, you know, moisture content's down, you kind of eliminate the problem. There's a little thing Jeff and I did. Um, 
been a couple of years now. About a year ago, yeah. About a year ago. Well, it's all a blur. <laughs> we, we were kind of doing the same thing, just a real quick and dirty little study, um, just to see what we would have to do to get mold growing on some pallets. And we got some heat-treated pallets. We wrapped them up. Uh, there are a couple different products, tight plastic, um, a Tyvek type vapor barrier from housing materials, and another group that we did not wrap and stuck them in a very small room, heated room, No, there's no air movement. And in these photographs, you can see we got mold on one pallet, just this, this little bit of black fur growing on, the, on this one pallet. We, we and, tried. And, and if you look closely at that, what I marked on that one is that that's the pith of that uh, stringer. Right. Um, so that was where the board had the highest moisture content right. um, when we started out. And, you know, this white stuff on, on the ends of the deck boards, that's just adhesive residue from the duct tape when, when we wrap these up. So, again, just kind of proving to ourselves and our industry cooperator, um, you, you got to really make some mistakes to, to, to get this mold growing. So j just some general um, comments on drying times. This is fairly old. This slide is, is kind of the older information that's been floating around out there for years, um, you know, just dealing with a 5 8 inch thick deck boards, previously air dried to 30 or 40 percent, takes about 20 days average. And, and this was, again, in at Virginia Tech, I, I believe. Um, that's a long time to leave pallets sitting around. It's, it's, Financially, it's becoming more difficult to do that kind of thing. Um, average air drying of green hardwood pallets, you know, it's going to be 20 to 60 days, you know, depending on time of year, weather conditions. You can go to a fan shed, which is basically accelerated air drying. You can cut that drying time in half to about 10 days average, um, but you incur costs of running the fans and the cost of the building, more handlings of the pallets. Um, kiln drying, you can go again from, from green to 20% in about five days, but you've got to have a kiln and again, more handling. Um, so some of the results that came out of this recent master's thesis. Um, one of the things they wanted to do was come up with accelerated drying schedules that would get the pallets down to average 25 percent moisture content and so they played around with different schedules you know, balancing speed with pallet degrade and they've come up with a schedule for both you know, one for red for oaks one for yellow poplar um, it's a modified heat treating and kiln drying schedule um, for the oak going from about 55% moisture content, which was the material they had, still very green, about 30 hours to, to get it down to where the, the stringers, that's where they were measure, measuring moisture content, uh, were down to about 25% moisture content. That gives you really nice dry surfaces on the stringers and in particular on the deck boards and that's enough to prevent the mold and mildew. Yellow poplar was even quicker, um, about 16 hours to get from green about 50 percent down to that 25 uh, percent moisture content. So I looked for any kind of a comparison with these heat treating chambers with moisture control and venting, um, but that was not included in this master's thesis, unfortunately. Would have been a great comparison. 
but uh, in practice, what I'm hearing is you know 12 to 24 hours um, from green down to about 25 percent moisture content on the surfaces, which, according to company claims, is you know that's enough. 12 to 24 hours. So your mileage may vary. Is the standard disclaimer. So again, from this recent study, uh, you know, comparing air drying with sand shed with uh, dry kilns, um, the air drying, just standard conventional air drying out in the open, maybe you know, under a roof, keep the rain off of them. Uh, the lowest daily operational costs from air drying, but not the lowest, lowest total drying costs. The fan sheds, and this was not a commercial fan shed. This was something that they made on site. So again, you know, standard disclaimer. Um, but um, they got the lowest drying costs down to 25% of the three methods. And steam kiln drying, including the heat treating, was the most expensive daily cost and total cost, but yielded the fastest drying down to 25%. So that's kind of difficult to compare, but they did a net present value analysis that showed over a three-year period, you know, throwing in all the costs, uh, the fan shed provided the greatest revenue generating method for drying pallets based on the cost values that they had for their studies. So, um, some interesting results there. Um, and again, the heat treating chamber was not included in that. So, uh, just if anybody needs them, I, I did find some energy costs related to the, the heat treating chambers. Uh, the cost to dry, the energy cost only to dry one standard 4840 GMA pallet, uh, the various energy sources. Uh, I didn't check to update those specific energy costs, but those are very flexible, as we all know. So I, this kind of brings me back, you know, what's going on in the real world? Um, I'm not aware of anybody using the the, uh, the steam kiln to, to dry pallets using those schedules from from the blount study yet or where they're at with the next round of investigation I, I'm hoping there's more being done there but again focusing on the mold and, and mildew issue um, it's not a performance issue it's you know, we, we, there are ways to do this. It doesn't damage the pallet, um, but it doesn't look good. And the concern is that the mold will migrate into the corrugated packaging. Customer is going to reject the shipment. So it's not a product quality issue for the pallet. It's a customer satisfaction issue. So we've got to deal with, with that. Um, and the way I see going about it, it brings me right back to where I started all these years ago. Um, historically, the pallet specifications were basic size and weight bearing capacity. And that's what people are bringing to the pallet manufacturers still. Build me a pallet that will do this for the lowest possible cost. And drying is not part of that equation. Um, absence of fungicides is becoming part of that specification, but drying um, is not yet. But this guy, Ulrich, I was reading his stuff, he said, you know, there is now this potential to, to bring this to the attention of people who are making their pallet specifications for the pharmaceutical industry, some of these other industries, and say, put this in the spec. And then the, the pallet purchasers have to deal with it. You know, getting them to change their spec is tough, I know, but this is this is where it's going to come from. I uh, found one case study without mentioning any names other than humongous full-service materials handling company dealing with the pharmaceuticals industry. Um, 
they, it, you know, they're not telling me what they're doing, but they have developed a process to air dry pallets after heat treating that has satisfied their customer who has, you know, had gone to various suppliers uh, before winding up with these guys. So, at least in this case, huge company, huge financial resources, huge multiple facilities, um, they are able apparently to, to do this and satisfy their customer on price as well. Um, I, I have no idea what they're selling these pallets for or what the price difference is between green and their air dry pallets. Um, and then looking back through all the pallet surveys, uh, these are for modern materials handling surveys of pallet users for the last few years. I hate to say it, but we all know it, price is still the primary concern for the majority of pallet purchasers. And you know, that's what it was when I was a kid, and that's what it is still. Um, but there was also finally this little comment towards the end of the survey. In some of these industries where the mold and mildew and product damage from moisture is, is becoming an issue or still an issue, people are finally starting to wake up and look at the whole process, not just the price of the pallets. And so, you know, the, 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 it, it gives me the feeling that maybe this is the, the turning point. You know, maybe people are finally going to, at least in some of these particular industries where these issues are are really huge, um, with the right people talking to each other, and they, maybe they'll finally start looking at the whole process and, and realize that they're spending money downstream when they could spend the money and get a dry pallet and you know eliminate most of their problems but again it comes down to working with these folks getting specifications written up you know at least for a particular industry and then you know the the push will come for for dried pallets and i always end with fractured fairy tales because it always seems like a fairy tale to me that Maybe this will finally happen. But um, if anybody is interested in that uh, that thesis, wants to look at those um, dry kiln schedules or some of the other information that, that was in that study, you know, just get hold of me or Jeff, and I, I can send that to you as an attachment on an email or send you the link to it, and we'll all live happily ever after. Maybe so. That's all I have. Well, thank you, Larry. That was very good. So I'm going to take back the screen here. And uh, we'll wrap things up here um, fairly quickly. Uh, if anybody missed it or forgot, again, John Swenby of Nine Block was going to be an additional presenter here, but one of his mills caught fire, and he's having to deal with the ramifications of that. Um, I hope to uh, get him in the future. Uh, so what I said I was going to do was, uh, at the end here, where we're going with this project, given that regulations are uh, not an issue, we had changed the scope to best management practices. That hasn't been a big selling point. Uh, so we're in the process of rescoping again. And this material, the, the history of where we started, um, and then came through, as, as Paul explained, uh, to where we are now. And, and also, Larry, one of, one of the best management practices voluntary would be dried pallets. Um, so we're going to uh, put together a PowerPoint presentation, but on a much broader, uh, of a much broader context. It'll include this material. Uh, plus uh, a, a bigger, bigger story of wood packaging and, and why it is good, if you will, wood is good, 
how it relates to uh, forestry, especially hardwood forestry. You get low quality stuff brought out, actually has some value. It brings out the better, the, the better stuff, the, the furniture quality stuff and things like that. Um, so I'll just close with one slide here um, from the APHIS uh, risk uh, assessment. They had an appendix, a uh, fairly lengthy appendix. This is, again, these were my initial thoughts on some voluntary things that, uh, and by, not, by no means all, uh, that uh, wood packaging uh, material manufacturers could do. Um, so this will be part of it, and uh, we will have another um, presentation similar to this of the PowerPoint presentation sometime in the spring. And if you're not on uh, our listserv, just send me a, an email. You have my email uh, if you'd be interested in attending that. Uh, and then um, as a final thing, I, I'll be sending an email to, to all of you uh, just with some basic evaluation questions for our, uh, our internal purposes. Uh, we can justify ourselves as the case may be. So uh, I'm going to uh, unmute everybody and uh, say again, thank you very much for uh, your kind attention. And... Uh, We'll call it a day and uh, try and stay warm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.